Another race, another win for Max Verstappen. But every every Grand Prix victory has its own taste, has its own feel. And sure enough, this was very different from anything Max had achieved before. Obviously in China, very impressive display from beginning to end. Winning the sprint race from P4 on the grid, taking the pole for the Grand Prix, and then effectively leading the Grand Prix from start to finish. Perfect start into turn one. Lost the lead for a few laps during the pit stop phase, but in total control. Didn't set fastest lap got to say that but that's only because Fernando Alonso late in the race came in on his Aston Martin having oddly chosen a set of softs when everybody else was on hards trying to go through to the finish the softs had gone off and he put on a new set of mediums and it was on those tyres that he regained a few positions and set fastest lap but Max won't worry about that this was a consummate victory yet again very little to trouble him a little bit of concern towards the end of the race about the amount of debris on the track and there was a lot of debris and we'll get onto that in a second it affected the race of some of the other front runners but let's go back to the start of the race Max as I say very good into turn one Sergio Perez kind of following him in wanting to to keep everything neat and tidy but Fernando Alonso of course on the outside looking for every opportunity and Sergio a little bit conservative allowed Fernando to get too much on the outside and then get the inside run into the tight left hander at the end of that turn one section so it was Fernando Alonso up to second place immediately in the Aston Martin wow Sergio Perez and then the two McLarens of Lando Norris and Oscar Piastri at Ferrari meanwhile a skirmish Neither driver very quick off the line. Charles Leclerc led Carlos Sainz into one. Carlos pulled to the outside, a little bit like Fernando Alonso. But on this occasion, Charles just basically edged him off the road. And while that was going on, George Russell and Nico Hulkenberg got in front of them. OK, Charles very quickly repassed Nico and they very quickly got past George. But it was a lot of time lost using the tyres perhaps too much than they would have wanted in those first laps. And this was all a result, of course, of the Charles Leclerc Carlos Sainz dynamic with which Ferrari now have to work. Yesterday, we saw Carlos Sainz probably upsetting Charles a little bit, running wide at the hairpin. Charles probably remembered that. He was now on the inside. Carlos is on the outside. And Carlos had nowhere to go. And as I say, look at the end of 2024 to see what this is all about. This is all about Carlos Sainz needing to assert himself as much as possible until he gets his deal sorted for 24. And anyway, a driver who's doing a good enough job in a team from which he should never be fired in the first place. And once you have that sort of drama going on, it does permeate throughout the team. That's what we saw today, I think, on the opening corner of the Chinese Grand Prix between those two Ferrari drivers. Meanwhile, at the front, Max Verstappen, absolutely superb in the RB20, managing the tyres on a full load of fuel, pulling away a second a lap from Fernando Alonso, effectively making it a relatively straightforward day now for Max, because there was no way Fernando was going to be able to keep up that pace. And sure enough, he was passed within two or three laps by Sergio Perez, partly because obviously the Red Bull is a quicker car than the Aston Martin, but also because Fernando pushed very hard on a full load of fuel on the medium tyre, and they very quickly went off. There was indeed a radio message from Lando Norris saying, Fernando's going so quickly on those mediums, it's good news for us, because we're sure they're going to go off. That was the gist of what he said anyway, and he was absolutely right. Fernando and George Russell were the first of the two front runners, if you like, to stop for new tyres. Fernando going onto the hard, George onto the medium, and following lap, Max Verstappen made an early stop because you can gain a lot here with the undercut and he didn't want to take any risks whatsoever. So we had Lando Norris now with Max having gone into the pits leading the Chinese Grand Prix and having taken it quite easy on full tanks. His medium tyres are in pretty good shape. So all of a sudden McLaren started thinking about running a one-stop strategy. A thought that was echoed at Ferrari with Charles Leclerc. And it was interesting to see those two stopping on virtually the same lap, one triggering the other, obviously. Leclerc on lap 21, Lando lap 22. As it turned out, the Ferrari was not as quick a car as the McLaren all day, even though they were very similar in terms of top speed. So whether that was the right call for Ferrari, we'll never know. But as a result, both Lando and Charles effectively ran the same one-stop strategy, whereas the two Red Bulls ran two stoppers. Carlos had obviously used his tyres a lot more in those early phases. He lost, lost more ground than Charles because of that turn one skirmish. And as a result, had to come in four laps earlier than Charles and ended up running a long 39 lap stint on the hard tyre in the back end of the race. And if we continue the story of that one-stop strategy, the one adopted by Lando and Charles, it enabled them to get past Sergio Perez when Perez came in for his second stop. And as a result, Sergio Perez had a relatively difficult race, always in traffic, always in dirty air. He passed Charles Leclerc to get P3. But in the late stages of the race, he was unable to do anything about Lando Norris. And that is to the credit, obviously, of McLaren and of Lando. For me, the best moment in the race was a radio message sent out to Lando Norris, which said, for low speed understeer, in other words, to cure, to try to help 
the cure the low speed understeer suggests using engine braking and it was really impressive i think to see lando reply no thank you and that gives an insight i think into the touch and feel of lando norris if you asked at and senna to use engine braking because he had an understeer problem he'd look at you as if you were mad because Ayrton was all about feeling every part of the car in a harmonious way going down in the days of manual downshifts going through every gear he would not even jump a gear so the, the concept of using engine braking or indeed jamming it into gear to do something with the rear was absolute anathema to Ayrton and it was wonderful to hear Lando say the same thing a driver of great touch as I've always said tremendous feel tremendous softness of touch and suppleness Lando has and feel for racing I just wish he, he wanted to make his corners a little bit shorter watching other drivers around him but I don't think he'll ever do that because he's so good at what he does he's just going to stick with it and it's paying off a little bit like Carlos Sainz if you take away a few of the errors from Carlos recent errors well this weekend but but Lando really really nice I thought in that response and and that in many ways summed up his drive in China wonderful use of the tires very very soft in everything he did and that's what was required today to get the best from the tires should should just add here that Oscar Piastri drove very well I thought in the early phase of the race but then somehow got massive floor damage over debris somewhere I, I mentioned debris earlier there's a lot of it on the track a lot of dramas going on midfield back of the field as well particularly at restarts after the safety cars a lot of debris and Oscar got a lot and here I, I'm jumping around a little bit but I might as well say it the back end of the race Lewis Hamilton who'd started on soft tires predictably Mercedes well we got a card near the back we might as well just roll the dice and put it on a different set of tires to everybody else so Lewis started on the softs which he didn't really like I mean with about four laps he was saying these tires aren't giving me any help at all and he came in quite quickly to switch to mediums and then he was really good and the car wasn't great obviously it wasn't perfect balance but he was doing well and he passed a lot of cars and he was good in DRS and, 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 and generally looked like Lewis Hamilton driving the sort of race he would from where he was on the grid. But late in the race, he was within touching distance of Oscar Piastri, within four seconds or so. And they both had the same tyre life at that point on the hard tyre, but Lewis could do nothing about Oscar Piastri. OK, Lewis didn't have a perfect balance, but Oscar Piastri was in quite a badly damaged McLaren, really having to look after the back end of the car as well, nursing the rear tyres. And he beat Lewis in that situation. So that, I'm not saying that's an Oscar Piastri, Lewis Hamilton comparison, but what I am saying that is a McLaren, well, it's more a statement of where Mercedes are because there's no way in the world, really, Lewis should have got beaten by Oscar today, given the state that Oscar's car was in. And I mean, Lewis drove well, and, and there's no doubt he got the best from the car throughout the day, I think. But what I'm saying is that Mercedes is a very, very difficult car to drive, quite obviously. George Russell did a good job after making Q3 and qualifying, started P8, finished P6. More of a damage limitation day, really, just trying to get the tyres to last the distance, which he did very well in his usual way. But the one of the other highlights, actually, was towards the end of the race when Fernando was on those medium tyres, those new medium tyres, en route to setting fastest lap, mainly because, amazingly, they'd actually run out of hard tyres and there were no other choices. And he came out of the last corner, turn 16, where Carlos Sainz had the big moment yesterday and spun across the track into the inside barrier. Fernando came out of that 16, obviously needed a little bit more road. Had there been curb there, he would have just gone up on the curb. But there isn't curb there, there's gravel. So he hit the gravel and the car just snapped sideways, as it did for Carlos. But on this occasion, Fernando caught it and just came back. And milliseconds later, DRS, and he was just off. The race continued for him. And we saw a replay, cockpit onboard replay of Fernando. And if you just watch, if you can see that again, you must watch it. You just watch only his hands on the steering wheel. And you just see this blur of correction. It is the most phenomenal thing. I've talked a lot about Fernando. And there's a couple of odd things about him, his initial steering input, and he's not the shortest corner driver in the world. Not that that's an issue, but he's just not ever in that area where Max likes to go or Lewis periodically. But he does have this unbelievable feel and touch, particularly his footwork and handwork. And the handwork on this correction was just like a blur, boom, 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 like that. And you blink and you missed it. And, and from outside, you just saw the Aston Martin going like that. And just brilliant that is those moments are what make formula one worth watching i think and a lot of people might be switching off at the moment because of the max verstappen domination all they want to see is different winners close racing but in reality it is that sort of detail that for me makes formula one so enthralling just to see that handwork on the other side of the coin this is 
Fernando and Aston back in the garage. And I, and I should leave out, Fernando out of this because I don't know the real facts. But if you get back into the garage now, I was absolutely astonished. After the miracle of Carlos Sainz yesterday hitting that barrier, and you've got to say here, maybe his handwork wasn't quite as quick as Fernando's, and that's maybe why he ended up there. But he did do a great job of broadsiding the car into the barrier. Very nice bit of, bit of uh, well, drifting work by Carlos Sainz. Um, but after that, I was enthralled by how well they they got that car back into the garage, that Carlos kept going, drove it back, kept everything right, temperatures didn't go off the clock, got into the garage, and within a couple of minutes, Ferrari had the car ready to do the second run in Q2 and got him right up there, right behind Charles on the grid. Unbelievable piece of work. That can only be celebrated as part of Formula One's very rich tapestry, that, that teams can perform like that, that drivers can do that, and despite making that sort of error and hitting a barrier, and then go out and do that sort of lap time. Unbelievable. And I was completely shocked, and this happened after we posted the video yesterday, that Aston Martin put in a protest about all that on the basis that once the car stops, it's gone off the track, you're not allowed to restart it and continue. And bearing in mind it took no time out of the delay, in other words, they were still fixing the barrier while Carlos did all this and drove back to the pits. And bearing in mind how impressive that was as an advertisement for how good Formula One is, I was astonished that they did that. I mean, talk about damp squib. Talk about, I don't know what, really. I mean, I'm very pleased that that protest was thrown out. It wasn't a great weekend for the FIA for a number of reasons. We'll get on to another one later, <laughs> later in the vid, but at the end of the race. But for and I'm pleased that this was thrown out because their argument was absolutely to the letter of the rule, whereas the stewards decided that there was precedent of other drivers having stopped and then driven back to the pits, A and B. The, the, let, the, the essence of the regulation is not to prevent drivers doing that anyway. And so it was thrown out, and that's good. But I, I just thought it was very churlish of Aston Martin to do that. I'm sure Fernando had nothing to do with it at all. Nothing about being passed by Carlos on the outside of Turn 7 in the sprint race, and then the little shunt that happened afterwards and the three penalty points he got. I'm sure Fernando was way away from all of that. He never gets involved in politics, he says with a smile. But anyway, yeah, you know, I'm pleased that that was thrown out. And, but I've got to go back to that Fernando catch coming out of 16. Because apart from anything else, to get the opposite lock on at exactly the right amount and exactly the right, right rate and not to have any snapback was just poetry in motion. But it was very fast poetry and very fast motion. Anyway, Fernando finished seventh and he'll, he'll, he, will, he will have said he got the best from the car. I suppose the criticism you'd make is that he just went too hard too early on that set of mediums, came in a bit too early. He could maybe have run a one-stop strategy as well had he not done that. But then telling Fernando not to push hard in the early laps, telling him not to be aggressive getting to the first corner is a bit like telling Etten Senna to miss a downshift on under braking. Never going to happen. Just going back to that protest from Aston Martin. As I say, I'm glad it was dismissed. So that was a good thing. But we did have that drama in qualifying when Lando Norris's pole time was taken away and then given back to him, which wasn't great. But it wasn't a good weekend for the FAA overall because after the chequered flag, and quite obviously Max Verstappen had won it, all the timing systems showed Lando Norris as the winner of the race. Now, whether that was wishful thinking by somebody there, I've no idea, but it stayed up for all the on all the timing systems that I could see for at least five minutes. Lando Norris having won that race from Sergio Perez and Max Verstappen, all with correct race times and everything else. Everybody was thinking, I mean, this is the moment when all the big TV companies in the world, all the news agencies are all looking at who won this race. They're all seeing Lando Norris won the race. As I say, probably wishful thinking by a lot of people. It took them about five minutes before Max was reinstated in terms of the timing back to his rightful position. So I think you can come away from this Chinese Grand Prix thinking there are quite a lot of loose ends that need to be tied up and tidied up at the FIA at the moment in various areas. But just to repeat the point, I'm very pleased that that Aston Martin protest was thrown out. That is for sure. Ferrari finished fourth and fifth eventually. As I say, Charles mirrored Lando Norris's one-stop strategy, but back into the race was nothing like as quick. As I said yesterday, it looked to me as if Ferrari never, ever got that car right in that one-hour session in which they, they were working on it, like everybody else. McLaren got it more or less right. Aston Martin got it more or less right. Ferrari did not get it right this weekend. So it was a difficult weekend for them, fourth and fifth. Carlos Sainz wouldn't be happy with fifth place at all, particularly what happened in the first lap. But nonetheless, he was fifth in the end. 
the car didn't have a lot of grip, didn't have a lot of balance. But um, given where he was after three or four minutes of Q2 yesterday, I think he'd be quite happy to take P5. Lewis eventually made it up to ninth, so at least some points, and he can go home thinking, wow, second in the sprint, ninth in the Grand Prix, making progress. And Nico Hulkenberg, again, bringing a Haas Ferrari home in the points. Wow, let's hear it from them. Some amazing racing midfield, back of the field, whatever you want to call it. Nico Hulkenberg, Kevin Magnussen, horrendous restart shunt involving Lance Stroll doing one of his things where he just cannons into the car in front of him as they're all breaking for the hairpin and then blaming everybody else. But and Daniel Ricciardo, who'd driven very well, looked like potentially possibly being in the points, having to retire as a result of that. And Guan Zhou finished 13th. And the first time I've seen this, but you know how the first three you just pull up on the track at the end of the race to be interviewed. They actually had a slot for Guan Zhou as well. Let's hear it for the local heroes. I wonder if Liberty have um, taken any note of my suggestion of several years ago now, but I keep coming back to it periodically, that we should have third cars in Formula One. They should be controlled, but they should be when there's a great local driver that can be given, that can do a lot for the promotion of the race. Okay, we have uh, Guan Yajou, but don't forget we had Yifai Ye as well. And to me, he was just as talented as Guan Yu. And I feel a bit sorry for Yifai because he never had the money, unlike Guan Yu, to go through the feeder series. And very talented guy doing very well now in world endurance but there's another chinese driver and if we had two of them it would have been even better than one anyway it was a capacity crowd for what that means not a lot of grandstands in shanghai i'm not trying to be dampening not trying to be negative there but the that tilka circuit isn't built with massive expectation of huge crowds there's the grandstands in the pit area there's a the grandstands around the hairpin braking area and that's about it yep they filled all those so good job and that's because of guan Yuzhou primarily i think Alpine kind of kept going as well, which was good. They didn't finish in the points, but Esteban Ocon, quite impressive in the back end of the race, doing very well. Pierre Gasly had a sort of difficult race. And at one point in the pits, we saw the right rear coming off in a pit stop. Terrible, terrible to see that. I know what that's like, Pierre. So, uh, yeah, don't say any more. It's usually a result of somebody assuming that something else is right. And it can, and it's interesting that it happened back in the 90s and it can still happen today. And I felt a bit sorry, I have to say, for Valtteri Bottas. He'd driven well all weekend, got into Q3 with the Sauber, as we say. But then the Ferrari engine just unaccountably let go and brought out the first safety car. He parked it on the outside. And for a while, the cars were sort of, they were under yellow there, but going quite quickly with him just unprotected getting out of the car. But very quickly, they put out virtual safety car and then safety car as well. So Baltry didn't finish. Engine failure. Don't see many of those these days, amazingly. Nothing, it seems, can touch, though, the Red Bull steamroller. Max Verstappen winning again. What a fabulous win. Lando Norris on the podium again. Getting quite monotonous with Lando as well. At some point, Lando's going to win a Grand Prix. Maybe may even be in the near future, but a very, very good drive by him. I think he got driver of the day for that. And I would have given him driver of the day purely for that comment about not wanting to use engine braking. I'm surprised they haven't discussed that. But, well, they probably have discussed it, actually, uh, because the, the tone of Lando's voice was, you could tell he was smiling when he said, no, thank you. So it's obviously something they talked about in a debrief. I don't really like to use engine braking. So that was good. And so there we are. Yeah. End of this this very, very tiring stretch of the Formula One Championship. And now on to Miami. Between now and then, some live streams for sure. So thank you to Pitbox, thank you to Jetcraft, and thank you to you, the viewer. See you soon.